think they really tapped into what uh, rock and roll really is, is supposed to sound like and is supposed to be. It's music as music should be played. It's fast, brash, loud, dirty, and with a political message as well, you know. Punk wouldn't have happened, certainly, without this. It's, it's been incredibly influential. Oh, hey, the five. The MC5 were a dangerous bunch of young, impressionable, loudmouth, opinionated rebels who used instruments to change things. I think it's funny, it's taken people 30 years to figure it out. Three years after they self-destructed, the remaining three members of what will be forever known as the MC5 came back together and for whatever reason decided to pick up their instruments and play their music again. Um, two members of the MC5 dead, but the three surviving members putting on this show and getting in, you know, people like Lemmy and, you know, people like Ian Asprey and... You know, we want to kick out the jams in that, you know? No, probably one of my favorite 60s punk bands, you know? And the fantastic thing about them was this, the buzz about it, the kind of excitement that it created, you know, tickets going for sort of in excess of, you know, 300 quid that's sort of outside the 100 Club on, you know, London's Oxford Street. Everyone in town is going on at the moment. Oh, I really, really hope we're going to get in. We're not going to give up, you know? Definitely. Keep trying. Yeah. And if you got in? <laughs> this is not a reunion of the MC5. We're, we're just here to celebrate the work of the MC5 and celebrate these songs and, and these ideas, you know, and try to carry this message to uh, the, the generation today. I don't know what I'm gonna say, so let's play. Gotta keep moving. The MC5 were the four greasers and a beatnik um, from um, Michigan um, who formed in 1965 and basically kind of, you know, producing this kind of Detroit sound, this raw, blue-collar, rough-edged rock and roll. Detroit's a rough-and-tumble, blue-collar town and uh, motivated by factories and fast cars. I was in art school and uh, a friend of mine did a painting of uh, a couple of rock guys on stage playing guitars. And I saw, I looked at this painting and I thought, I don't want to paint anymore. I want to do, I want to be there. I want to be that guy in the painting. Wayne Kramer was lead guitar. Fred Smith was uh, rhythm guitar and lead. Um, Rob Tyner was the lead singer. Uh, he passed away in 1991. Fred Smith passed away in 1994. God bless both of their souls. Michael Davis is the bass player. 
we were like a, a, a hit team, a SWAT team. And that's exactly how we <laughs> pretty much approached life at that time. They were in complete contrast to the whole kind of hippy-dippy flower world of San Francisco because they came from an industrial town and a town with its musical basis in the blues and black music. You have to remember the era now. The era is all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Dennis gets the name Machine Gun Thompson not just because it's cute and fits, but because he is the machine gun. Wayne is the guy that pushes the thing in the experimental direction. He's the guy that wants to find out more of what's in that sound world. He's a passionate, intense player, and it means everything to him to play music. I mean, I'm a professional musician, I'm a songwriter, and I'm a record producer, and I run a record company, and uh, um, so this is, this is a daily activity for me. I'm your man. We're here rehearsing today in London for a performance next week um, that's a celebration of the music of the MC5. I'm your man. First rehearsal we've had here uh, since uh, 1991. I don't know. What is that, fellas? 12 years? 12 years, yes. Uh, first rehearsal feels great. I got to keep it up because I'm a natural man, a born hell raiser. I don't give a damn. You don't forget these songs. There's like muscle memory, you know? It's like muscle memory. If I think too much, I won't be able to do it. really much, otherwise we wouldn't fly to London to see them. So to see them survive, a part of them survive, it's right about now, it's everything. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. When we got the mail from a friend in Denmark, Anders, I was like, hello, this guy joking. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I'm sure it's gonna be a real big party, anyway. People where we, came, where we come from, we are the only one, people with the long hair and look like I look the way we do. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> so we're in uh, our own heaven when we arrive at the Hungry Club here in London. There's actually a person coming from Japan. <laughs> yeah, there's coming a girl from Japan. My name is Yukiko Akagawa. I came from Japan to see the MC5 <gasps> for for a, for an autograph for the. Uh, Dennis Thompson, this is he. One, two, three, four, ooh. Now keep it going. Now keep it going. Now you guys over here. It's all night, it's all right. I'm standing here before you, mama, soaking wet. You think you're satisfied, you ain't seen nothing yet. I said, wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am, a born hell raiser. I don't give a damn. People are fed up for this manufactured corporate rubbish that's in hell, right? What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm singing three songs of the MC5, so I'm a lucky man. Oh, come on! The kids want a little action! The kids want a little fun! The kids just have to get their kicks before the evening's done! Cause the whole thing's too
the MC5 had been on motorhead. Really? I wanted to, I wanted to form the MC5 because they broke up. So I wanted to have a new MC5 so I could get their spot. But it didn't work out that way because the singer quit, you know. Lemmy! I would like to tell you something. Without these guys, there would be no motorhead. There would have been no damned. There would have been none of them bands. These guys did it all first. The MC5 is name checked a lot. White stripes and strokes and the hives. Ultimately, the reason the MC5 is so influential is because they suffered for their art. And you know, it's a sad, it's a, it, I mean, it's a sad indictment on the world that it takes, it, it, it takes a, a band to self combust and be misunderstood in order for us to turn around and say, wow, how great were they? But ultimately, you know, their music still stands up. The MC5 represents a kind of uncompromising stance uh, that is held up pretty well, generation by generation. And each new group of musicians seems to discover the MC5, because the MC5 was never successful in its day. You know, we, we never pulled the golden horseshoe out of our ass. You know, we never sold millions of records. It's a perfect time for the MC5 to come back, because you've got you know, what you could call a new rock revolution with bands like sort of, you know, the, the White Stripes sort of being at the vanguard and, you know, bands, even bands in Britain like the Libertines. Because once again, it's like you need bands who are kind of antidotes to kind of that very sort of squeaky clean sort of manufactured pop that we've got going on elsewhere. The MC5 sort of made it uh, okay for younger bands to be reckless and still maintain their integrity. I was born and raised in the city of Detroit, and I went to like all Mexican schools and all black schools. So by the time, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, I didn't have any friends that liked rock and roll. Well, the song, Looking at You, uh, to me, that was the first guitar solo I ever learned how to play. I sat down and learned how to play the exact notes of Looking at You. Um, and that song, I just would not stop listening to, about 16 years old or something like that. And it was just, that was it for me. That was just rock and roll, you know, 100% A-plus rock and roll, top drawer. And that solo, I just wanted to live that guitar solo. The music is just as relevant today. Funny, it's a funny thing because they were writing anti-war songs back. It was about Vietnam War, and now we've got the whole Bush thing happening now, so they're as relevant today as they were then as well. American. 
Detroit um, in the mid 60s was this center of kind of like racial disturbance and at the same time kind of like young kids being sent over to Vietnam to fight and kind of war protest. Our manager John Sinclair was unified and in touch with the Black Panthers and the Students for a Democratic Society. We sort of got labeled the band that was taking this dance uh, for the counterculture. And the fact that there was this band who were in tune with that, were in tune with ideas of revolution and, and were making a kind of noise that was kind of, you know, part the noise of a car factory and part the noise of war. We played at the Democratic National Convention where the riots were in Chicago. And we were the only band to play, the only band to show up. There were helicopters overhead and there were uh, half tracks and armored cars and mounted police with four foot batons. Uh, altercation began at the back of the crowd and the uh, police just started marching through the people on their horses and batons and just started beating the crap out of people. We had to get off the stage and get shuttled out of there before they threw us in jail. Well, the fact that they had this soundtrack of kind of like revolution and disturbance, you know, it, it kind of sealed the fact that they were this kind of vanguard for a revolution because they were making the soundtrack to protest and alienation. It's all coming out of black music. James Brown, well, we'll say Detroit, James Brown, all that, Memphis, all that stuff. It's Philadelphia International. These guys are just playing the rock and roll version of all that stuff with their story. We had a party called the White Panther Party, which was uh, simpatico with the Black Panther stance. When, when G. Gordon Liddy read White Panther propaganda about this rock band that wanted to tear down everything that would keep people from being free, by any means necessary, he took us seriously. Once they started getting arrested, once they realized that they were on kind of FBI lists and they were being monitored, and once they started getting, you know, hassled by the police, they realized the power that they had, something that began as a teenage joke, became something that was actually a threat to society. You know, you'd pick up your phone and you'd hear and you'd be talking to someone, or you'd be sitting in your house and the police would pull up and they would shine spotlights on you and run their sirens in the middle of the night, you know? You know, so this atmosphere of fear starts to build and it's just kind of gnawing in, in your gut, you know? And then we find out years later that it was all true, that they were tapping our phones illegally, that they were following us around, you know, that they were intercepting our mail, that we were really, there was like uh, dirty tricks were ble being, being played on us. One of the weird things about the MC5 is so much of their kind of like later story is played out in London. When we, came, when we got to Europe, we had some problems with some drugs, which led to the ultimate demise of the MC5. So you've got this situation in the early 70s where the MC5 are stranded in London and not only just stranded in London, but they've all got, apart from Rob Tyner, these really rather severe heroin habits. I have this disease of, uh, of alcoholism. Drugs and alcohol became a way to uh, live in a world that I couldn't live in anymore. The demise of the MC5 is really quite sad because it's not like, it doesn't end in this big explosion or big argument. It's just basically people start to peel off. And I lost my guys, I lost my band, I lost my friends, I lost my way to make money. I lost my whole status in my community, you know? Um, and it was the beginning of a, a very bad time for me. Wayne, you know, started sort of dealing and started stealing and, and basically became kind of a kind of, you know, a street criminal to just kind of make ends meet. And so obviously the kind of ultimate result of that, he ends up in prison. I was a very bitter man for a long time. And, uh, you know, I, w I was really resentful of other people's success. You know, I would see young bands come up and maybe they would have the hair of, that I had when I was young or the claw. They'd, they'd move on stage like I used to move. And I just, it burned me up, you know. I see, wow, uh, these people, they ain't shit, you know. My, I was better than that. Uh, nobody knows. And I would just, it would just feed on itself. I was very bitter. I was very angry. And it took finally, uh, coming to grips with uh, the grief and the loss, you know. And when, when Rob Tyner died and when Fred Smith died, I really had to accept um, that loss. Today, I've found a way to live where uh, drinking and drugs aren't necessary. Right now, it's time to kick out 
truly serious and, and, and very true about your music, your influences will always show through, you know. You should never try and hide them, you should celebrate them kind of thing. And we celebrate the MC5 for just that reason. They are, they are the band why I got into rock and roll music. MC5. It's, it's got that feeling of just that pure, drilling on energy. The first album that the MC5 did for Electric Kick Out The Jams was basically a live show that they'd been playing for about the last two years. The cool thing about that album is that you feel like you're there. It's just, it just jumps at you, totally jumps at you. It really changed me totally. It just made me think, Christ, you know, you don't have to rely on studios to make great music. Kick out the jams, motherfuckers. Basically, if you're not good enough to stay on the stage, then fuck off. You know, there's the whole kind of philosophy behind them at the time. At its highest, the MC5 represented the possibility that we could change the world with our own hands. Whatever we did, we started something that just won't go away. This is uh, something I've been waiting for for 30 years. I wish I was Superman and I would fly so fast that I could turn back time and then... Uh, see it again. Yeah, again. Maybe see we again. could fly. It was a moment my dream came true. Uh, this was the best day of my life. 